Let's take a look at an example of a motion problem that's going to require us to use integrals. And let's try to calculate the displacement or the uh, net change of position associated to a particle that's moving with the following velocity function. So its velocity of v of t is given as t squared minus t minus 6. We're measuring this in meters per second. So by the, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we actually know that since... Uh, velocity is the derivative of position. If we want to find out the change of the change of position, this um, this displacement. If we want to figure out the displacement of the particle during the time period one to four, uh, this displacement s of four minus s of one, this will equal the integral from one to four of the velocity function. Now we don't have enough information to know what the position function is because we would need some information about where is it located at time equals zero or something like that. We need some initial value. But with just the velocity at hand, we actually can calculate the net change of position, the displacement of this thing. So S of four minus S of one, This we, we can figure out how far it moved in this time period. This is gonna be the integral uh, from one to four of the velocity function. And so using the velocity function they have up there, uh, we get t squared minus t minus 6 dt. By properties of integration and by the power rule, uh, for antiderivatives, we'll get t cubed over 3 minus t squared over 2 minus 6t. We evaluate from 1 to 4. And now we hit the most arduous part of the whole calculation here, the arithmetic. We plug in 4, so we're going to get 4 cubed over 3 minus uh, 4 squared over 2 minus 6 times 4. And then we have to subtract from that uh, when we plug in 1. So we're going to get 1 cubed over 3 minus 1 squared over 2 minus 6 times 1. Uh, simplifying these things, uh, six, 4 cubed is a 64. Uh, 4 squared is an a, or is a 16, uh, which we get 16 halves right there. 6 times 4 is 24, so that's our first group. Uh, for the second one, we get 1 third, 1 half, and 6. Uh, combining like terms, we could take away uh, a third from 64 thirds, which gives us 63 thirds. We can add a half to negative 16 halves, which gives us negative 15 halves. And then lastly, we're gonna take negative 24 plus six, which is a negative 18, uh, right there. And then continuing to combine some like terms, we get some fractions here. Uh, six, well, I guess 63, uh, 63 thirds, we could, we could simplify that thing uh, a little bit more, couldn't we? Uh, three goes into 63, 21 times, like so. 21 take away 18 would give us three. Three minus 15 halves, it's somewhat un unavoidable in that situation. We get six over halves, take away 15 halves, and then that gives us a difference of negative nine halves, uh, like so. And this represents the displacement of our particle. And here we get a negative value. We actually do want to keep it negative. I know in previous videos, uh, we saw that when you're looking for the geometric area, we want that to be positive. But in this situation, we want this to be a negative value. And so this would tell us that the displacement is equal to negative four and a half meters. Um, the negative is important because it gives us a direction. It tells us that it is, uh, since it's a negative 4.5, it's to the left of the quote unquote zero location. And so if calculating displacement just comes down to computing an integral. There's not much more to it than that. Um, suppose, on the other hand, though, we want to find the distance traveled by the particle during this time period. We want to find the total distance. In that situation, the total distance is actually going to be the integral from 1 to 4 of the absolute value of the velocity function dt, like so. And so how does absolute value affect how we would compute this? Well, we would want to be looking for an antiderivative of our function when we take the absolute value. And putting the absolute value in there kind of complicates the antiderivative process, but there's a nice little trick one could do to sneak around that. 
if we were to graph our velocity function, so you graph it with respect to time right here, notice velocity uh, v of t we had before was t squared minus t minus 6. If we were to factor that thing, uh, this thing factors, uh, well, factors of negative 6 that add up to negative 1, we can take t minus 3 and t plus 2. And so we'll get we'll get to, uh, these would actually represent the critical numbers of the original position function here. Uh, we're gonna get three and negative two. So if we're only interested in the domain one to four, you'll notice that the number three falls inside that region, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna break up our integral into pieces based upon this number three right here. So we're gonna integrate from one to three, absolute value of v of t dt. And then we add to that the integral from three to four of the absolute value of v of t dt. And so why we break it up that way is that our velocity function is gonna look something like the following. Uh, if we come over here, it was it was somewhere, it was somewhere above the x-axis, and it crosses at three uh, to somewhere below the x-axis right here. I guess I actually take it the, take it back, it should probably be the other way around. Um, our function's gonna look something like this. It crosses the x-axis at three, like so. And so the area that's under the curve when you're to the left of three is gonna be positive, but the area to you when to the right of three, excuse me. But when you're to the left of three, it's gonna be negative area right here. And so we can break it up because there's no x-intercepts between the between one and three and three and four. If we take absolute value, it's gonna be all negative or all positive. So the absolute value will just turn everything to be positive in the end. And so then we can actually take the absolute value outside of the integral process. We integrate from one to three vt dt. And then we also integrate from three to four vt dt. And this is the same velocity function we had before, this t squared minus t minus six. So like we saw on the other, so on the other slide here, if we integrate from one to three, uh, we're gonna get t cubed over three minus t squared over two minus six t as we go from one to three, absolute value. And then we also do this for the absolute value of the, the next one, integrate the exact same antiderivative t cubed over three minus t squared over two minus 60 as you go from this time three to four, like so. So you have to break it up into two pieces because this first region right here, we're actually gonna get that this was going backward because the velocity was negative right there. Um, and then the other one, this is when it was moving forward. In the first calculation we did displacement, the forward part cancels with some of the backward part. And so we only got the net change, which is a negative 4.5 meters. Uh, this time we wanna consider the whole, the whole situation. Our particle was moving backwards and then starts to move forward a little bit. And so pr the previous calculation was only looking at the net change in position right there. But this time we're interested in figuring out what is the length of this entire journey, like so. And so to do this calculation, we gotta plug in, uh, we gotta plug in the, the, in the one, the three. Uh, so we have this absolute value. We got uh, three cubed over three minus three squared over two minus six times three uh, minus from that one third minus a half minus uh, six right there. That's in the first absolute value. And then in the second absolute value, we're gonna have 64 over three minus 16 over two minus 24 minus this three cubed over three minus three squared over two minus the six times three. We haven't computed that one yet. This all sits inside the absolute value. I do wanna point out though that this expression right here is identical to this one, but they don't cancel out because they're separated by these absolute values. We can't just throw them together. Now, I'm not gonna bore us with the de with details of the arithmetic this time around, but if you do the first set of absolute values, you'll end up with a negative 44 over six. And with the second one, you end up with uh, the absolute value of 17 over six. 
And so, like I said, this first distance was moving backwards, which is why we got a negative. This one was moving forward, which is why it's positive. Taking the absolute value, we get 44 over 6 plus 17 over 6. Or in other words, 61 over 6, or approximately 10.17 meters was the total distance traveled by this particle. Uh, which is a lot bigger than the absolute value we saw last time, 4.5. And that's because a lot of the lot of the journey of this particle actually double backed on where it already was. And so the displacement's not going to see that. The displacement is just the regular definite integral, and it gives you this net change. If we want to know the total distance, what we have to do is take the integral of the absolute value of the function. And because of the absolute value, you want to break it up the function v of t along its x-intercepts and treat each piece differently, um, making sure that you take the absolute values of each of those pieces, focusing, of course, where are the x-intercepts. We took our interval, remember, one to four, and we had to break it up at three. That is taking the integral from one to three, and then from three to four. So net change, pretty simple, just calculate an integral for total change. Uh, gross change. In that case, you have to find the x-intercepts and then integrate each of the intervals that are divided into smaller pieces using these x-intercepts.